thank you all and thanks for can everyone hear me okay and see the screen okay excellent um so anyway want to take a few minutes and um talk about cloud hpc integration and what i want to do is take a little bit of time and just introduce you know it's a company and why is a company you know you're always you know and my positions in the past in academia i was always or research areas i was always afraid of any kind of commercial presentation so um, i just wanted to start off by introducing omnibond omnibond is actually a spin-off of clemson university from a number of years ago it has a leadership team um, jim bottom and myself um, Jim Bottom was a former chief operating officer at NCSA. He's been CIO at Purdue and Clemson. I have been software CTO and director of computing for engineering school at Miami, Ohio. And so we've done lots of work and had a long history in academia and research computing. Um, on the other side, Omnibond has been around for a number of years and actually started out being a back-end engineering company um, in this spin-off state. Um, for identity management um, from Novell and now even Microfocus. So that group still does identity management integration. We do work in the parallel file system space with Orange FS, um, including taking it upstream in the Linux kernel and continuing to do work there. And we do computer vision and AI-based um, analytics with our traffic vision division. And then what we'll talk about today is cloudy cluster and you know how to do cloud orchestration, but really want to talk about it um, from a community engagement, not from a sales pitch um, and, and that type of situation. And hopefully we have time for demos if I don't ramble too long. Um, I like how we start about this is, you know, why did traditional IT go to the cloud? And, you know, what, what, what caused that phenomenon? You, you know, we had, um, AWS started and we started to see things like Netflix and other web applications go there for obviously for seasonal scalability and or you know drop this movie you get to see it and then we start to see retail and other things move stuff just for that seasonal scalability and then there's also unsteady workloads but it really started from like that web application framework and and the ability to scale massively um, and, and then you know, additionally, you start to see cloud specific technology, you know, the latest, greatest GPUs, CPUs, you know, even other processor types show up. And a lot of people just took their dev test and QA. So you took your typical business system, like your HR system or something, and you figure your dev test QA. And we used to have tons of those systems scattered all over. You'd have to have them pristine and the hardware would have to be sitting there. Um, and then, you know, that, that was a real easy thing to go to the cloud. Um, some of the, at the time, you know, virtualization software on-prem was very expensive. So we started to see that and you didn't even have to pay for these things. You just had to launch them when you did your testing and turn them off. So, you know, we've seen a lot of efficiencies, but when we speak about high performance computing, um, it's been more efficient. You know, HPC admins have been able to maintain things. It's been designed to optimize use for hardware. So it hasn't, you know, started to make its way, for, you know, we start to see pockets here and pockets there, but it, it isn't the wholesale move. Um, so we really think about it, you know, as uh, how do you integrate? What, what are the things, where does it make sense to use the cloud? Where does it make sense, you know, to, to leverage on-prem um, and, and those types of things? You know, what is this cloud opportunity, cloud HPC opportunity, you know, instant compute availability? And a lot of these things we thought about as we went through designing the software, thinking about it, you know, is this something that makes sense? You know, you have instant compute availability, instant storage availability, again, device diverse resources, um, massive scalability, maybe, um, you know, and, and then again, cloud specific technologies that they build on top of things to try to make things easier. And, you know, but when we're in the HPC space, we say, hey, well, what about latency? What about scalability at low latency, you know, what about just general scalability and, and, you know, the big one, what about cost? So I want to try to talk a little bit about each of these um, as we look at this as a, a potential avenue. And so when we were thinking about, you know, what cloud HPC could look like, you know, what we really wanted was 
HPC job portability. You know, you really should be able to take your job from on-prem and take it to the cloud, at least the mechanics of it. You know, there is the data aspect. And so, you know, you can't ignore that, you know, you have to have your data where you're processing, but, you know, at least the mechanics of running it should be the same. So people can go from place to place. Um, you know, it should have, you know, the same software as on-prem and easily get the same software as on-prem and not, not this big complicated um, factor. Um, support the diverse resources. Um, you know, on-prem systems, you can tie stuff back to billing. You should be able to do that as well in the cloud. And one of the things about the cloud, because you're renting these systems, is you really need to dynamically scale up and scale down. You need to use it when you need it and then tear it down when um, you're not using it. And then, you know, tiered long-term data storage, scratch storage, you know, all those things that you're used to, login node, scheduler, um, and then again, optimize for cloud specific resources. And what we tried to do um, was, you know, look at all these things and, you know, you know, does someone really want to build it themselves? You have to deal with all the images, instances, the VPCs, firewall config, security constructs, you know, the auto scaling, keeping up with the latest APIs to keep things close together. So you have the MPI. Um, and then again, integrate the storage and provide all the security around it. And, and that's where we said, you know, maybe there is a market here for something. So that's where we kind of went ahead and we developed Cloudy Cluster. Um, and again, we've developed other software packages. This is our, our most recent, um, that had stuff used all over the world in different, in different avenues. But, you know, the, the HT, HPC market is, you know, the research computing market is, is, is different. Um, and what we really wanted to do is we're able to develop something where you could automatically deploy a fully functioning HPC environment. You know, we tried to provide the familiar HPC and HTC experience, um, include a lot of the libraries, the open source things, the integration that you expect, MPI comes out of the box, you have things configured. Um, and some interesting things is as we were designing this, we said, well, how do you solve this problem? You know, there's several different schedulers out there. People like to use a couple different ones. How do you integrate this? And instead of building kind of scheduler add-ons, we said, you know, you really need something that runs in front of the scheduler that can do things like manage the spinning up and tearing down. Then it integrates with whatever scheduler they want on the back end. So we actually developed the meta scheduler we call CCQ. And, and then, and we'll get to that in a second. And then there's also like the different storage options. You really want it to run in the customer's own account for security purposes. You don't want them to have to, you know, different types of data, have to build, you know, example, DAAs or other research agreements. You know, really want this to be software they can launch in their own account. And, you know, integration with the billing labels and automatically leverage things that optimize the performance in the cloud. And that's where, you know, we spend a lot of time working with the cloud you know, you know, Google and AWS developers and the product managers to find out how best to optimize for these things. And, and here's kind of an overview of, the, you know, how it, it works. And, you know, you could see there's the libraries that you use. There's a lot of the HPC software. Um, you, you can, you know, see if your favorite packages are there and you kind of get an architecture here. There's a control instance that you can see right here. And its job is to kind of spin up and make the environment available for base and provide a web user interface. And then you get your login node. We have some tools that people are familiar with there, open on demand and Globus probably. And then you have your scheduler instance, which can be Torque or Slurm. And that's actually where the meta scheduler CCQ runs as well. And then you have your parallel storage if you need it. You have object storage if you need it. And then you know, the, the dynamic compute that can spin up as you launch the jobs. And we'll kind of walk through how that works. You know, when you create a job, this is kind of your typical Slurm job. You'll notice that, you know, your, your S batch commands tell you the number of nodes, number of tasks per nodes. And, and in this example, CCQ will go through and pick the instance that's kind of priced optimal for that. So if you choose a small number of nodes, you might get these really wimpy instances, but you know, you, you can can let CCQ kind of auto pick for you. And what it does is it spins up the instances, provisions users, registers with Slurm, um, it launches the job, job runs, job completes, and it tears down the instances when the job is done. Um, 
So it's kind of very simple, straightforward. You could see how you could take a job from on-prem to the cloud. But what if you wanted to do something on Torque instead of Slurm? So you spin up an environment with Torque, and then again, it does the, you know, uses the PBS commands to determine that same kind of process. Then if you want to kind of say, well, hey, I, I want to use this instance type because the C2 instances types in Google have the placement policies are close together so we can get better MPI performance. So that you can actually put the CC directives in addition to this. So you could see you, you could run this and then you could still go back to on-prem and run it and the CC hint will be ignored. Um, and then you get an instance type. But you, but you can hard code this to any size you want. You can you know, look at things versus cores versus hyper threads, because you know, C2 standard four is four hyper threads, two cores. And you know, if you wanted to just run a two process job or if you wanted a 30 true core job because your thing doesn't like hyper threads, then you know, it gives you the ability to kind of to make what you want happen. And you can have multiple of these jobs with different configurations all run at the same time. Um, you can also add a dash UP, and that means it's going to use a preemptible instance. Now, preemptible instances might be good for high throughput workloads, not necessarily as good for MPI workloads, as they might pull one of those nodes out from underneath you. Uh, preemptible instances save you a bunch of money, but you can run them for a max of 24 hours, and then if they, you know, need the resource, that they can pull it away from you, and you get a, a, a two-minute one. Here's kind of some of the other scheduler directives. Um, you know, you can let nodes kind of go to ready before the others just spun up. If you want to do some really large scaling types of things, you can skip the provisioning stage if you want to bake things into the image. Um, and the one thing that I do want to highlight is you can easily take an image of Cloudy Cluster, launch it without the Cloudy Cluster software running, add software, then go back and launch it again, and then you'll have that additional software on all the nodes in your cluster. And you can have to, you know, you can also pick, you know, have different images for different job types. You know, if you have this really big need for a large amount of space, but you don't want everything to use that, you can have custom images that are spun up um, as jobs are launched. You can do billing label integration um, and, and others like that. And we'll, we'll share this slide deck. I have a lot more information in the slide deck um, as we go along. Um, we've done some HTC scalability. You can go out, there's a blog post out there. We did, um, you know, a couple million concurrent vCPUs, you know, spun it up within three hours, you know, over 6 million vCPU hours of processing across multiple um, cloudy cluster environments in different regions to get the capacity. But it's pretty interesting, pretty straightforward job. And we've been working again towards um, MPI performance. And working, you know, kind of Google is very interested in this lower latency scaling. And so we've been working closely with them. And this is a SDPB solver, um, some energy physics workload that leverages MPI. And, and so we were able to do a comparison with an on-prem system that had um, FDR and Finiband. And you could see the, um, you know, on-prem is the yellow. Um, the, the blue is kind of the unoptimized CentOS image, and then the red is actually the, you know, cloudy cluster built on top of Google's new HPC image. Um, we, we did that in partnership together. And we actually took it out one step further, but we didn't have the on-prem numbers, so we didn't report those back. Um, and we actually continued to see scaling up to 480 cores. And, and that's true cores, not hyper threads across 16 instances. So, so the scaling of MPI is getting better. Um, and, and we actually, you know, didn't test it to where it started to curve back up um, as you normally see when things start to fall apart in MPI workloads. So, you know, we're interested in, in testing and trying out different things, trying larger workloads. And um, so, so we're, we're excited about that. Um, we're, we're community focused. We work with different communities. Hopefully, you know, we'll be able to start integrating and work closely with these communities. We've done things like hackathons at supercomputing and PERC. Um, we've done Cloudify gateway solicitations in partnership with Google where people bring problems and we help them kind of take their workloads to the cloud and, and looking forward to doing some of those in the future. One of the interesting projects that we did is um, look at take open on demand, which is a project out of Ohio State Supercomputer Center and kind of do a proof of concept working with the OSC team and, and the other partners 
and, and kind of build it on top of Cloudy Cluster. And, and then we actually took it in our latest release, we actually fully integrated. Um, and, you know, if we want to take a little bit of second, we, you know, here's the Cloudy Cluster interface with all the instances up and running. Um, and, you know, you can go to the access tab and then you can, you know, go up and you know, say, oh, here, I want to go to open on demand. I already have it up and running. You could do the file browser of your home directories and shared storage. You can um, launch with, or very interesting, you can launch these interactive desktops. Um, so I have a Jupyter notebook and a cloudy desktop. So here's a Turbo VNC session into a compute node. And this could be any size compute node. This could have GPUs behind it. This could have, you know, whatever you want associated with it um, as you launch those. And, and it's just a job running in the background and it'll time out um, based on the time that you put in. And here's a Jupyter notebook. Um, here's an example. And I actually have a sample, just a very rough sample, where we actually have something called CCQ client, which is a Python client that you can actually pull in and leverage. And you can do things like submit jobs and do stats. So we'll do a, a stat. I've already logged in and done the user and password for this session. And then there we go. There's a CCQ stat. You can also submit jobs um, and also obviously delete jobs and transfer data in and out. Um, so, you know, you have the ability to launch these interactive Jupyter notebooks. You have the ability to launch larger HPC jobs. Um, so we really like the fact that we've integrated with this. Um, a couple other quick slides. Um, you know, consumption, people always say, well, what is this? Um, we, we came in with a pricing model where we just charge 5% of what the on-demand costs are. You can get it from the Google Cloud or the AWS, the Google Cloud Marketplace or the AWS Marketplace. Um, and one of the things that we thought was very interesting, I want to talk about pricing and pricing is this difficult thing. So I always like to highlight when companies are doing what feels like the right thing. And if you think about um, research networks and you have the ir irrefutable right to use, you know, you know, you know, fiber lambdas type of things, um, you, you know, it, it, Google has come up with this concept where you can actually do a subscription um, and you come up with agreements and say, hey, this is the workload I want to put into a grant. It's big enough that Google cares about it. Um, and then you actually can fix a price and Google actually has skin in the game and they actually will hold the risk um, while you do these things. You'll monitor it monthly as you go into this. And, and, and if you go over a little bit, it's okay. What, what Google's worried about is you actually don't go enough. So we really like the fact that they're fixing it so you can fix it into a budget. And we think that's kind of finally heading in the right direction versus this, you know, go talk to procurement and say, well, I don't know how much is this going to cost? And they say, well, then you can't buy it. Um, so it, it kind of opens up some opportunities. Um, I'll leave these slides in for everybody. We also will help with things, do jobs, do integrations, other things like that. You know, our main focus is a product company, but we do know people need help kind of with the things around it. So we're, we're more than willing to help. And then I left in here some um, examples of work and people can look at those at their leisure. Um, and with that, um, let's go ahead and move to some Q&A. All right. Thanks a lot, boys. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I, I have a question off the top. Uh, well, actually, let's go to the question that's in Slido. It just popped in. All right. Um, the question is, at the risk of getting uh, overly technical, how do you handle cross AZ availability in AWS? We're already hitting limits in certain availability zones with just 0, 100 EFA nodes for HPC. And the AWS recommendation was to do cluster per job versus traditional scheduler. Does CC, CCQ help solve this problem? Um, so in AWS, um, what we can do is you can launch, you know, that base environment in different availability zones. Um, but, but, you know, you still kind of, if you want the low latency, if you want the connection, you need to, to kind of do those together. We do have a, when we did that very large scaling thing um, on Google, and we did another one prior to that um, on AWS, where we actually have multiple environments running. And we actually have a tool um, th that we have that we've open sourced that you can, and we did that in conjunction with our, our the research lab at Clemson, 
is to where you can actually direct different jobs to different um, environments. But yeah, you're still kind of limited. What, one of the things on the Google side that's interesting is they just released an API, and I hope AWS does something similar, where you actually make a request, and that request will actually say, well, hey, you can have those here. And, and so it can actually kind of do that. And we'll be, we're doing a little bit of a, a rewrite to CCQ, but we'll be integrating that as part of this kind of later on this year. So when you launch a job, it'll actually go to different locations, and hopefully AWS has something similar in the works. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I have a question, and I will just wait for more Slido questions to queue up. Um, have you done any, you know, apples to apples cost comparison? And, and is it fair to say that an apples to apples comparison is, is even possible? Um, what's your, what's your thinking on that? Um, the, the apples to apples cost comparisons are difficult, um, just because you know, you have to kind of, and having run an HPC system at Clemson kind of been responsible for the budget, you know, you have to take into account the power of the cooling. Is the power and cooling subsidized? Is the, um, it, what's the usage of the machine? You know, if you have GPU nodes where you're running non-GPU jobs, you are wasting money, you know, on-prem. And so it's really hard to take it. Now there's, so, so, but if you say a fully utilized, and I'm really good at running the, the job, um, you know, of using every cycle that you're running on the compute cluster, you know, there is a price advantage to on-prem, um, but, but you kind of have the plumbing problem where you have to build the pipe big enough to, to fit it. And, but, but the cost is getting closer and things like that subscription model or other things make it a little more competitive. And, and, and if you're doing a big project, make sure you negotiate some discounts. Don't, don't pay retail, don't ever pay retail. <laughs> yeah, excellent advice. <laughs> Always. Sorry. So uh, we have another question that popped up in Slido. Many models, intentionally or not, assume a luster-like parallel file system where every process, e.g. MPI rank, uh, can see every file. Do the file systems on these platforms provide anything similar? So th that's why within Cloudy Cluster, we actually give you the option to deploy Orange FS which is actually kind of like a, a rebirth of PVFS. If, for those in the file system station, remember that we're actually working with Dr. Ligon to kind of continue pushing that forward, really focusing on this cloud space. Um, so, so we do have a parallel file system in there. You are paying for the nodes to run that. Um, it, it's up, we're, we're looking at doing some interesting things in the future where you can have it on demand based on the jobs. Um, but yeah, those jobs, you know, do, do have, you know, those cloud, you know, we do need those for those jobs. Um, you know, AWS does have a Lustre file system that you can deploy. Um, we still kind of just deploy the um, Orange FS as part of it, just because of the, the work we do and we can test and prove it a little better. But um, so, so those are the options. So yeah, you are, but you do definitely need that. I do agree. Okay, fantastic. Uh, 